As we all know, music culture can at times be an extremely self-destructive environment. Not to mention, studies have even shown that musicians and artists in general are oftentimes more susceptible to things like depression and addiction, whether that be a result of something internal or external. As a result, we've unfortunately seen a lot of really talented people pass before their time, but strangely enough, that can actually lead to a deeper appreciation for the art they left behind. While people like Kurt Cobain, Amy Winehouse, and Bob Marley were already widely loved musical figures during their lifetimes, their early passing elevated them to an even higher legacy status in music culture, and in many cases, these artists have been retconned as some of the most important figures in their entire genre. Though it's definitely easy to get hung up on the tragedy that none of these artists will ever perform again, it's very important to remember that we should look back on them in a positive light, and I think this legacy status I'm talking about there helps us do that a lot more than anything else does. How's it going, folks? My name is Jack Miller, I am the incredibly underqualified punk historian, and I am absolutely thrilled to be diving back into the world of 90s skate punk with the story of one of the most beloved bands in the entire genre, no use for a name. As I always do, I'll be giving you all the rundown on the band's history from their start in the small scene of Sunnyvale, California, to their current place as one of the skate punk community's favorite bands. I'll of course also be including some of my personal thoughts on them, and specifically my thoughts on why I happen to think No Use was one of the most important bands to ever happen to skate punk. Before we get started, I just want to let you all know that I made a Spotify playlist of some of my favorite No Use songs, and I'll include a link to that in the description below. And finally, if you are interested in seeing videos about punk rock, may I humbly ask that you please subscribe to my channel here. I'm having a lot of fun making these, and I want to make sure that all of you can keep having fun watching them. Anyways! As you may have heard me say in the intro, the story of No Use for a Name begins in the town of Sunnyvale, California. The band initially formed in 1986 and was founded by guitarist Chris Dodge, bassist Steve Paputsis, and drummer Rory Koff. They would recruit Paputsis' friend John Meyer to be their vocalist, and the quartet quickly adopted a rough, fast, hardcore sound akin to what I like to call the thrasher skate punk stuff like Ill Repute, JFA, and The Faction. No Use soon began getting themselves out into the local scene, and after performing as a four-piece for a short while, they would take on two more members in rhythm guitarist Doug Judd and co-vocalist Ramon Grass. As interesting as this six-piece lineup sounds, they unfortunately didn't record anything until a couple years later on into their career, and no performance footage of this incarnation of the band exists anywhere on the internet either. While this certainly makes sense as these guys were all probably still in high school when this was going on, it doesn't make the fabled six-piece no use any less intriguing. The large lineup would eventually thin out the following year in 1987, starting with the departure of vocalist John Meyer, and later rhythm guitarist Doug Judd. This would leave the vocal duties solely in the hands of Ramon Grass, and the band is a four-piece yet again. Chris Dodge would also part ways with the band in 87 to join the Berkeley-based Sticky, leaving no use in need of a guitarist. This would not last long, however, as the remaining three members would recruit a particularly talented guitar player from the neighboring city of Cupertino by the name of Tony Sly. Although he initially joined just to fill the shoes of the former guitarist, it would not be long until he started making major contributions to the songwriting. This lineup of Gross, Paputsis, Cough, and Sly would produce the band's first ever single, Gang Way, in the fall of 1987. The track would gain the band a few new fans in the NorCal scene after appearing on Maximum Rock and Roll's Turn It Around compilation. No Use would then dive headfirst into 1988 by recording a demo in San Francisco. While they were originally intending to release these recordings on an album through Alchemy Records, they eventually decided against it as they didn't like the deal they'd been offered. This demo, of course, isn't available on streaming, but I was able to find a YouTube link that you can find in the description below. Although it was likely added in later for the YouTube upload, the recording begins with a phone message from Ramon Gross stating how it came to be. Either way though, this demo is definitely worth a listen if you're into fast, noisy, old school skate punk. This demo would also be the final recording to feature Ramon Gross's vocals, as he would part ways with the band later that year. Interestingly enough, in his statement at the beginning of the demo tape, he says he left the band over a dispute on what the lyrics should be written about. He didn't elaborate on this very much at all, but either way, he was officially no longer a part of No Use for a Name. To make matters even worse, Gross actually parted ways with the band just before they were supposed to play a show at 924 Gilman, and were scheduled to perform on the KFJC radio show. In desperate need of a vocalist, the band called up their former guitar player Chris Dodge to come and fill the role. And no and behold, he agreed, not only to the two pre-scheduled shows, but to become a full-time member of the band once again. No Use then signed with Woodpecker Records 
Records, through which they dropped their first 7-inch You Bug Me in 1989. This would be the only release the band would do with Woodpecker, though, as Chris Dodge founded his own label slap a -Ham Records later in 1990, and they would relocate to join the new label's roster. No Use would then release their second 7-inch Let Em Out through slap a -Ham later that year. Now, the 80s No Use for a Name is really a different band than the melodic skate punk ensemble that would rise to prominence in the mid to late 90s. Of course, they shared three of the same members and obviously the band name, but in terms of sound and in a lot of ways scene too, this era of No Use is more of a different band by the same name, as opposed to a more primitive version of a band that grew into a more mature sound. A good example of the latter here would actually be Bad Religion. Sure, their first couple releases are a little more raw and hardcore than the melodic sound they grew into, but it still very much sounds like Bad Religion at the end of the day. In the case of the hardcore No Use stuff, they were really obviously just going for something completely different, and while I would certainly recommend all three of the releases I just talked about to anyone who would consider themselves a fan of old school hardcore, this definitely isn't a band that writes songs like Soul Made or Dumb Reminders, no matter how much maturing or refining they do. All of that being said, though, the departure of Chris Dodge following the release of Let Em Out would leave the guitar, songwriting, and vocal duties now in the hands of Tony Sly, and the fall of 1990 was about to change everything for No Use for a Name. No Use, and particularly the newly appointed lead vocalist and head songwriter, had taken an interest in the melodic, harmony-heavy breed of skate punk that had recently made its debut at the hands of LA legends Bad Religion, along with several other newly established bands like NoFX, Pennywise, and The Offspring. Although up until this point, the bands pioneering this new flavor of punk rock had pretty much exclusively come out of LA and Orange County, the sound had of course made its way up to the East Bay and other parts of the US and Canada through the underground tour circuit. This grabbed the attention of a whole new audience of young musicians and inspired them to write their own lightning-fast, harmony-packed punk tunes and ship off demo tapes to Epitaph Records, who at the time were largely the only label putting this stuff out, or at least the only one big enough to where people outside small local scenes were paying attention to it. I'm sure if you're watching this video, you probably know that Tony Sly was of course one of those many musicians to catch no effects in Bad Religion when they came through Northern California, and then go home and write his band a brand new set of songs chock full of melodies and fast drums. After Tony had spent God knows how long alone in his room with his guitar, he and the other two members of No Use worked up an 11 song set that they would bust back into the East Bay scene with. They would also put together a punk rendition of the police's song Truth Hits Everybody, which would be the first in a series of covers that No Use would feature on their albums over the years. The band would also part ways with Slap a Ham and were picked up by another East Bay punk label called New Red Archives. No Use were still a bit of an outlier as the only melodic skate punk band on the roster, but New Red was definitely a far more appropriate home for the band as they had several other not quite skate punk but definitely melody driven punk bands like Swing and Utters and Sam I Am. Slap a Ham on the other hand was quickly becoming the go-to label for fans of power violence and other abrasive hardcore styles, so I think it's pretty safe to say that No Use made the right decision here. Once things were all squared away on the label front, the band would then mosey on down to Hollywood and record their debut full length album at West Beach Recorders with none other than Brett Gerwitz of Bad Religion and Epitaph Records. Although they weren't an Epitaph band, their sound, reasonably close proximity, and reputation in the scene had likely put them on good terms with a lot of the label's associates, so getting in contact with Brett was probably just a quick phone call. After a five-day recording session in September, No Use for a Name's debut album dropped on November 16, 1990 under the name Incognito. Most of the reviews I found online for this record give it a pretty average score, but if you ask me, I think this is a pretty strong release considering less than a year ago they'd been a totally different band. Is it the best skate punk record of the year 1990? No. And it's certainly not the best release from No Use for a Name either. But you have to remember that this was still a brand new sound that had only been around for a couple of years at this point. And you have to give these guys credit for being ahead of the curve with it since there was still no way anyone could have predicted what would become of skate punk in the mid 90s. Not to mention the Bay Area and Los Angeles were really two completely separate scenes back then. And while you definitely see a lot of bands touring through and playing shows in either city, especially in the late 80s and early 90s, there wasn't a whole lot of crossover in terms of musical style, and I think this was another thing that No Use was ahead of the curve on. And as a band from a different scene, I think going straight to its heart and recording with Brett at West Beach was the best decision they could have possibly made. And while there's no way we can say for sure what he did or didn't add to the record, I think Brett Gerwitz probably played at least a minor role in shaping the next chapter in No Use's career. 
Impressed by the new album and the buzz his old bandmates were getting, Chris Dodge would rejoin No Use for a Name for the third time in early 1991 as a rhythm guitarist. They then dove right into what I can only imagine was a super rigorous touring and writing schedule, especially for Dodge, who was now simultaneously still managing Slapaham. With Dodge back in the band, No Use quickly got to work on drumming up another new batch of songs. The first one to officially be released went by the name of Death Doesn't Care and dropped on a four-song EP with three live recordings. One one of these live songs was the opening track from Incognito, while the other two along with the new single would later appear on No Use's next full-length release. This second album would be recorded in 1991 at the Music Annex in Menlo Park, California, and was produced with the help of Pat Coughlin. The album was given the title Don't Miss the Train and wouldn't be released until October of 1992 despite being recorded nearly a year prior. If I had to guess, the band probably recorded the entire album during their sessions for the Death Doesn't Care single. And and just built up some hype through touring in the teaser EP. Nonetheless, when the record finally did drop, it was more than strong enough to follow up Incognito, and the album pushed the band even further in the right direction. Along with a positive reception from their fans and the larger punk scene in general, the record also caught the eyes and ears of NoFX frontman Fat Mike, and No Use would be picked up by the newly established Fat Records around the same time as their fellow East Bay bands Good Riddance and Swingin' Utters. Despite how well skate punk was treating him and the rest of the band, though, Chris Dodge's heart was still very much at home in the hardcore scene, and he would part ways with no use for the last time in late 1992 in favor of his newly formed power violence trio, Spaz. No use would then recruit Robin Pfeiffer as the lead guitarist, and Tony Sly would fill in the role of rhythm to focus more on vocals and songwriting. The new lineup would then enter the studio at Music Annex once more and got to work on their first release with Fat Wreck. The band would work firsthand with Fat Mike along with producers Don Cameron and Pat Coughlin in the studio, and the ending result was an eight-song EP under the title The Daily Grind that came out on May 31st, 1993. I would say this EP was the strongest release No Use had at this point in time, and you could really tell that the band, and especially Tony, were really getting the hang of the melodic skate punk thing. Plus, with the crisper production and scene cred from Fat Wreck, I would say The Daily Grind is what put them on most people's radar as one of the strongest bands in the melodic skate punk cohort. That being said, No Use and pretty much all of their peers were still on the way up, though, and just like it did for a lot of other punk rock bands in California, 1994 and 1995 were about to change the lives of this young punk rock quartet forever. The band would then take some time to refine themselves a little more before hitting the studio once again for their debut full length with Fat Wreck. Also, something I forgot to mention when I was initially filming is that Robin Pfeiffer would part ways with No Use at the end of 1993, and the rule would be passed to Ed Gregor. No Use entered the studio at the Razor's Edge in San Francisco and began sessions for their third full length release sometime in 1993. Production duties would be taken on by Fat Mike and the now highly acclaimed Ryan Green, and the finished product would be a crisp 12-track masterpiece that I think a lot of fans would regard as one of, if not the best, No Use for a Name record. Its official debut took place on February 15th, 1995, and was given the name Leche Con Carne, and it showcased what I would say is the final product of the 90s No Use sound. The band had certainly been doing the melodic skate punk thing more than competently up until this point, but Leche Jay Cohn Carne is the album that really established them as one of the genre's key players. It seems like all of a sudden Tony's songwriting had really taken off and this record just hits the listener with one incredibly enticing banger after another. It opens up with the riffy, metal-inspired Justified Black Eye and then two songs later slides right into the pop-punk earworm Soulmate. The versatility going on with this album was off the charts for its time, especially since in this era most skate punk bands tended to lean one way or the other when it came to melody versus metal. Leche Con Carne also included a number of covers, the first of which was a punk rock rendition of Bob Marley's Redemption song, while the rest were all compiled into a two and a half minute medley that took the place of a hidden track following the album's official closer. This smash hit record of course gained no use a significantly larger amount of recognition in the music scene, and the band even scored themselves a supporting slot on the Offspring's 1995 tours in the US and Europe. The band would also shoot a music video for Soulmate that would be picked up by the MTV show 120 Minutes. And I know for some of you older cats watching, this might have been one of the first places you heard No Use. Something you might not know, though, is that this was actually the first Fat Wreck video to ever air on MTV. And it actually got pulled from the show when Fat Mike refused to give them the rights to air any no effects videos. Fat Mike and Tony Sly both reflected on this in the 2009 documentary 1994, and although Mike stood firmly on his decision, it sounded like the No Use guys were a little 
little annoyed that their video got taken down at the time. On a side note though, if you haven't seen 1994, I'd highly recommend checking it out if you get the chance. It's a fantastic documentary about 90s punk with interviews from some of the era's most important players, including Tony Sly. 1996 would send the band through another series of lineup changes, beginning with the departure of guitarist Ed Greger, who would be replaced by Chris Shiflett, the younger brother of face-to-face -face bass player Scott Shiflett. Although this might have set them back a little bit, since No Use already had sort of a revolving door of guitar players up until this point, it probably didn't hit them nearly as hard as the loss of their longtime bassist and background vocalist Steve Paputsis. This role would of course be passed on to the former face-to-face -face bass player Matt Riddle, and even though Paputsis wasn't a crucial songwriter or anything, losing a founding member like that can hit a band pretty hard. So hats off to the guys for rallying the way they did. Not to mention, learning how to harmonize with someone's voice is a totally different ball game than teaching someone a guitar or bass part. And as someone who's in a band that does this a lot, I can't tell you how much of a pain in the ass it can be to dial in the vocals at times. But like all other things, nothing was gonna stop No Use for a Name in the 90s, and the next two years would bring even more exciting adventures for the recently successful band. Despite the obvious setbacks of having to reform their lineup, No Use pushed through and entered the studio yet again, this time at Motor Studios in San Francisco. And with the help of Ryan Green once more, the band cranked out another 12 songs. Much like they had done before the release of Don't Miss the Train though, they decided to drop a single song on an EP several months before the album came out. This EP came in the form of a split with pro skater Steve Caballero's band Soda and was released through Sessions Records in 1996. It included a track from each of the band's upcoming releases as well as an additional B-side from Soda. If you haven't heard of Soda, I'd highly recommend checking them out. They're a painfully underrated melodic skate punk band that's definitely worth more than a brief listen. Their stuff isn't available on streaming though, so I'll leave a YouTube link to a playlist of all their recordings. Anyways, the next release from No Use would of course be their highly anticipated follow-up to Leche Con Carne. The album went by the name Making Friends and debuted on August 19th, 1997 through Fat Records. Despite its mediocre to average reception from critics, it was of course extremely well received by fans, and I think it's pretty safe to say that this is another classic No use record at this point. Although I don't know if I'd say it's my favorite album of theirs, it definitely holds a special place in my heart since it was one of the first albums I heard from them all the way through, and it also includes my favorite No Use song of all time. Along with that flawless musical number and 10 more brand new tracks from No Use For A Name, the record also includes two covers, the first of which was a fast punk rendition of the Irish folk song Fields of Athenry, and the other was a mid-tempo pop punk cover of Kiss's famous ballad Beth. The ending of the KISS cover transitions into the opening riff of the band's hit from the previous LP, Soulmate, before it's interrupted by Tony Sly yelling and the abrasive noise of instruments being atonally plucked, strummed, and smacked. Following the release of Making Friends, No Use would also issue a comp titled The NRA Years as somewhat of a best-of comp from their early 90s catalog. They would then embark on numerous tours worldwide, branching off into new territories like Japan and Australia. After roughly two years of touring and promotion, No Use would then return to the studio yet again in June of 1999 to begin sessions for their fifth studio album, More Betterness. In their typical style, this record would also include a cover of an older track to accompany the new originals, and this time it would be a pop-punk arrangement of the Pogue's 1987 single, Fairy Tale from New York. Just like the original, No Use's version also featured a duet between a male and female vocalist, and the other half of the duet was recorded by tilt singer Cinder Block. The band would also shoot a music video for the song Why Doesn't Anybody Like Me, however it did not perform quite as well as their previous video for Soulmate had. After another average response from critics and a positive one from their fans, the band would then resume their active tour schedule following the album's release. This time around that would include a co-headliner with their label mates The Mad Caddies, along with a solo US headliner with Diesel Boy and Zero Down acting as support. Things would run their course until the end of 99 when Chris Shiflett would pursue his rock star dreams after being recruited to play lead guitar in the Foo Fighters. No Use would find a replacement guitarist in Dave Nassi, and after getting him up to speed, they would resume their tour schedule for the next two and a half years or so, during which they 
took part in Fat Rex Live in a Dive series and released their live album coincidentally on September 11th, 2001. Their live record included a performance of their version of Bob Marley's Redemption Song, along with another cover of The Misfits, I Turned Into a Martian. The Live in a Dive album would serve as further promotional material for the remainder of 2001, until the band hit the studio again in January 2002. No Use would reunite with their favorite producer Ryan Green once again to bang out another 12 brand new tracks for a sixth studio release. The record leaned even heavier into the band's poppier side and would showcase several new tracks that quickly became staples in their catalog. And just as they always did, the band also recorded another new cover, this time as a fast punk version of Sinead O'Connor's song This Is A Rebel Song that featured guest vocals from Karina Denicky of the Dancehall Crashers. No Use also shot a video for the album's single, Dumb Reminders, and would officially release it on June 18th, 2002, alongside the highly anticipated LP, Hard Rock Bottom. The new full length proved to be another massive success for the band, similar to Leche Con Carne, and garnered itself a reasonably positive reception from critics and, of course, the utmost enthusiasm from fans. The album's pop punk flavor also allowed No Use to serve as sort of a gateway band into the larger world of punk for fans of the bubblegum or TRL style of pop punk that was taking over the world at the time. In fact, after their initial headlining tour in the fall of 2002, the band would hit the road as a supporting act for Sum 41. No Use would then follow up their extremely successful U.S. tours with headlining legs in both Europe and Canada, and finish off their first run of promotion with an appearance on the show Last Call with Carson Daly in April of 2003. The band would then take a longer break from recording. While they would continue on a secondary batch of tours, it would not be until winter of 2005 that they called up Ryan Green again for another proper recording session. However, they did release the single This Ain't No Way to Live for Kung Fu Records' Punk Rock Is Your Friend, compilation in 2004 and shot a music video to go along with it. I also want to make note here that this was around the time that Tony Sly begun his acoustic singer-songwriter side project. Although it started out as a split album of acoustic renditions of No Use and Lagwagon songs with Lagwagon frontman Joey Cape, it would later evolve into an entirely different musical project of its own. I have to say it doesn't really do all that much for me personally since I'm not huge on slow song ballad type of stuff, but it's certainly very well written music and if you are into that type of thing I definitely recommend checking out Tony's two full length albums, 12 Song Program and Sad Bear. As I mentioned earlier, No Use entered the studio for the fifth time with Ryan Green once again in the winter of 2005 and begun recording their seventh studio album. Writing on the heels of the successful Hard Rock Bottom and the longer break between albums, anticipation for this record was a little higher than usual. Not to mention after the artwork and track listing were posted online a little over a month before its official release, I think it's pretty safe to say that fans were more than ready to hear the record when it officially dropped on June 14th, 2005. The LP was named Keep Them Confused and contained 13 brand new tracks. It would also mark the first release in No Use's catalog since The Daily Grind to not include any covers. This record would also lean even further into the band's more pop pop side, and I would say it actually might be the most accessible release in their entire discography. Following the release, a video was also shot for the album single For Fiona, which quickly solidified the heartfelt song dedicated to Tony Sly's daughter as a fan favorite track. Although for some bands, drifting in this pop-friendly of a direction may have come across as sounding forced or put them at risk of losing a few fans, Tony Sly's singer-songwriter approach to writing punk allowed this transition to flow so naturally that I think even some of the people who may have been a little surprised by it still couldn't help but enjoy it. Plus, they'd clearly been heading in this direction anyway with their previous release, and they probably had scored themselves some softer edge fans during the Sum 41 tour, so I think this was actually a really appropriate and smart move for the band. No Use would then resume their busy tour schedule on various headlining and supporting runs over the course of the next three years, along with several appearances at different festivals including Grows Rock and Wakestock. No Use for a Name would release a Best Of compilation in July of 2007 that featured 24 fan favorite tracks from their Fat Rec catalog. The comp would also include two previously unreleased songs from the sessions for Keep Them Confused by the names of History Defeats and Stunt Double. And while fans were enthused by the compilation and the previously unheard songs, the band would get to work behind the scenes for a new LP. Recording sessions for No Use's eighth full-length album begun in late 2007 at the Blasting Room Studios in Fort Collins, Colorado 
Colorado. This would be the first time in 15 years the band had done an album without Ryan Green, and this time production duties were taken on by Descendants drummer Bill Stevenson. The album would then make its debut on April 1st, 2008 as the feel-good record of the year, and presented more of a variety package in terms of sound. Some of the tracks featured an up-tempo skate punk style like Leche Con Carne or Making Friends did, while others a more accessible pop-punk flavor similar to that of Keep Them Confused or Hard Rock Bottom. Nonetheless, the record received an extremely positive response from fans and critics alike, and at least as far as the punk rock community was concerned, it fully earned its title as the feel-good record of 2008. A video was also shot for the album's opener and single Biggest Lie, and made its debut nearly two months after the record's release on May 28, 2008. No Use would then return to touring after the boost from the record and video, and kick things off with an Australian co-headlining leg with their fat wreck label mates strung out. They would continue their standard touring schedule for the next couple of years into the 2010s, but would go through two more member changes upon the departures of guitarist David Nassie in 2009 and longtime drummer Rory Koff in 2011. The pair would be replaced by Lagwagon and former RKL guitarist Chris Rest, as well as former RKL drummer Boz Rivera. Although at this point in time the band had no trouble finding solid replacements with minimal setbacks, their career would only last a few more years as it was abruptly cut short by a tragedy that I don't think anyone could have predicted. As I'm sure a lot of you guys watching probably remember, on July 31st, 2012, we were hit with the tragic news that Tony Sly had passed away in his sleep the previous night. It was later revealed that his death was a result of the combination of pain medication and alcohol, but there was no further elaboration to determine whether it was a suicide or an accidental overdose. The specifics here aren't terribly important though, as the fact of the matter was that one of punk rock's most impactful songwriters was now gone forever. No Use for a Name's remaining members would play one final tribute show to their fallen vocalist and songwriter at the Envol and Macadam Festival in Montreal, Quebec on September 8th, 2012. The three members of the most recent lineup would be joined by Dave Nassi and Rory Koff, and the show also featured guest vocal performances from Joey Cape, Karina Denicky, and several others. This was intended to be the final No Use for a Name related performance, however the remaining members would reunite one more time in 2015 in celebration of Fat Records' 25th anniversary. With the loss of such an integral member, this would unfortunately mark the permanent end for No Use as a band. And as much as Tony Sly's death is a tragic moment in music history, as punk fans across the world mourn the loss of one of the genre's most impactful songwriters, instead of focusing on the negative, I'd like to shed some light on how the band's legacy lives on through their impact on their fans, peers, and punk music as a whole. For pretty much their entire career, No Use for a Name were kind of an underdog band. They were certainly big, especially by punk standards, but they never quite had the same amount of reach as some of their peers like No Effects or Pennywise did. I'm certainly not trying to discredit them by saying this, but rather the point I'm trying to make is that they were very much a cult favorite band for their entire career, and they didn't get a whole lot of recognition for how great their music really was, or the unsung impact it left on skate punk and pop punk alike. If you're a No Use fan, then I'm sure you can attest to how strong of a songwriter Tony Sly really was, and most of the other Fat Wreck bands seem to say the same thing when asked to speak about it. No matter who you hear it from, though, the fact of the matter is that Tony truly had a gift when it came to music musical composition regardless of genre, and personally, I think No Use was one of the key bands when it came to laying the foundation for the pop-punk explosion in the early 2000s. Regardless of how any of us might feel about the more mainstream TRL or bubblegum pop-punk stuff though, the fact of the matter is that it did get an entire generation of people into punk and hardcore as a whole, and No Use was not only a huge influence on that sound, but also a great gateway band from that scene into the larger world of punk. Not to mention they were very much one of the original melodic skate punk bands from the early 90s California scene, and possibly the first ever to come out of the Bay Area specifically. Add that together with their nearly flawless catalog, and I'd say they left twice the mark on skate punk that they did on pop punk. Cause let's be honest here, how many teenage skate punk bands in the late 90s weren't rehashing no use riffs? Like I was saying earlier though, for a long time they would often get brushed aside as just another fat rec band, instead of truly getting getting the credit they deserved for pushing the boundaries of punk songwriting the way they did. And as unfortunate as it is that we lost Tony, I think in a lot of ways his passing has immortalized him as one of the greatest punk songwriters of all time. This is of course nothing new to music culture though, and on a more mainstream scale, Amy Winehouse is another great example of this happening. She was certainly successful in her respective scene, just like No Use, but I think the noise her extremely diehard fanbase made when
when she passed really made a lot of people give her music a second chance and discover just how talented she really was. And this is pretty much an identical story for a lot of punkers and no use for a name. I think a lot of us who weren't yet in the know may have cast them aside as a band who is quote unquote pretty good, but didn't really pay attention to them as much as we did some of our other favorite bands. So a lot of us may have not realized what an incredible songwriter we had in Tony Sly before he was gone. Of course, No Use will probably never be as well known as some of these other immortalized musicians like Bob Marley or Jimi Hendrix who were taken before their time, but you have to remember that this is punk rock we're talking about here. So naturally, a band from an underground scene like that isn't gonna reach quite as far as someone who made more accessible music like Hendrix, Winehouse, or Marley. Nonetheless, the underground has certainly produced more than a few of these immortal figures, and I think a better comparison to Tony Sly might be someone like Chuck Schuldiner from Death. Death, of course, had a super dedicated following all throughout the 80s and 90s, but I don't think it was until Chuck's passing that the metal scene truly realized what a one-of-a-kind figure they'd lost. Especially since now, Death have pretty much been branded as the godfathers of death metal by the entire metal scene. And although I think this is something their fans would have said about them back in the day, I don't think everyone in the larger metal community was quite on board with that yet. Simply because they were just more into their own favorite bands, like some of us might have been more into ours when No Use was still around. To be honest, I'm kind of an example of that. I was a little late to the game with No Use, and I didn't really pay attention to them as much as I did other bands. But after Tony's tragic passing broke the hearts of so many people in the scene, I decided to dive in a little deeper and get a bigger idea of what I'd been missing out on. I unfortunately never got a chance to dive into No Use when Tony was still alive, partially because he passed when I was still a pretty young teenager and still relatively new to punk. That being said, I was definitely aware of them to an extent, and I guess I was just another person that didn't realize how important of a figure we had in Tony until 2012. Since then, though, I've definitely fallen in love with their music the same way I'm sure a lot of you guys watching have, and they're definitely in my top three list of bands to go back in time and see, probably second only to RKL. I'm kind of a skate punk nut myself, so I'd say I prefer their mid-90s catalog the most, but I definitely love all the different eras of the band, and I think their pop punk stuff from the early 2000s fares pretty well against most anything from its respective sound and era, as does their hardcore stuff from the late 80s. Plus, it's such an insane story of how this small-time hardcore band would go through a couple member changes only to fall into the role of one of the most impactful skate punk bands of the 90s, and then go on to write some of the best pop punk of the early 2000s. It takes some serious songwriting chops to be able to bounce around like that and nail things right on the head every time, and I think that says a lot about how fluid and versatile of a songwriter Tony was. Also, with all the cover songs they did throughout the years, it's pretty clear that punk, hardcore, and pop punk weren't the only things these guys were into, and I think the varied influence pool not only made Tony a better songwriter, but garnered no use a more inclusive and musically diverse audience as well. As much as we all wish Tony Sly were still alive to front no use for a name to this day, though, we do still have his music and legacy, and I'm pretty sure as far as all generations of skate punk fans are concerned, no use will forever be a staple in the history, development, and prime years of the genre until the end of time. Anyways, I think that about sums up our history lesson on No Use for a Name. I really hope y'all enjoyed this upload because I have to say it feels great to be talking about 90s skate punk again, since it's been way too long since I've done a video on this stuff. Before I go, I do want to let you guys know that I will be setting up a Patreon pretty soon, and I'll probably be doing another update video with more information on that. Also, thank you guys so fucking much for the almost 17,000 subscribers now. I swear to god, it feels like it was just a couple weeks ago that I did the 10,000 subs video. Fucking incredible. But I think that's enough for me. I want to hear what you guys have to say. What's your favorite No Use for a Name album? Do you have a favorite song from them or maybe a favorite era? How did you first become a fan? Thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you next time.